Our task is not nurturing enthusiasm, but overcoming indifference. Before we start the show, I'd like to talk to you about Brandwatch, which is a digital consumer intelligence company. It helps businesses better understand their consumers and buyers with clever software that enables them to analyze conversations from across the web and social media. To find out more, visit brandwatch.com and you can sign up for up to the minute consumer insights in your inbox each week at brandwatch.com forward slash bulletin. And it's worth mentioning that my business, Automated Creative, uses Brandwatch every single day and our business would be impossible to deliver without it. So it's of real pride that I welcome them as partners for this week's episode. Hello and welcome to the Shiny New Object Podcast. My name is Tom Ollerton. I'm the founder of Automated Creative and this is a weekly show where I interview the leaders of the marketing industry about their vision for the future of the business. I am on a call with Patrick Neche, who is Marketing and Innovation Director, DAC, plant-based at Danone. So Patrick, for anyone who doesn't know who you are, can you give the audience a bit of an overview? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Tom, for for having me. So, yeah, as you said, my name is Patrick. I am a French-Brazilian born and raised in Sao Paulo. Uh, I started my career, I think now around 18 years ago uh, as a strategic planner in at Ogilvy. And then from there, I jumped to the to the sort of the client side and worked in companies like uh, Nestlé, Heineken, as well as uh, Pernod Ricard in, in Brazil. And then uh, during my time at Pernod Ricard, I was uh, I moved to, to Paris, France, and uh, I stayed there for around five years. Moved to Danone in Paris, and eight months ago I moved to to Germany uh, to join the plant based team for Danone in this Dach uh, cluster. So yeah, very excited to be here. Fantastic! Right, let's get to it. If a student was listening to this podcast and they're thinking, right, I really want to follow in Patrick's footsteps, what would be your advice to them? How can a student get ahead? In today's market? Yeah, I think I mean, I, when I talk to sort of younger people and I mean, back in my, in my days as a student, I think people interested in marketing, sometimes they obsess a little bit with sort of the, the marketing uh, technique, right? Uh, what are the levers? How do you uh, manage your PL? And I think all of that, obviously it's fantastic. And it's sort of the bread and butter of how to be a good marketer. But I think in order to have some sort of, uh, of, an, of an edge uh, and, to, and to have a different point of view and add value to the business, I think you need to be uh, also very, very much interested in everything else. So I'm talking music, I'm talking arts in general, I'm talking design, I'm talking politics, right? I think this is what this sort of uh, overarching and, 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 and a sort of a cross-connected perspective is what allows you to make the connections and to then deliver work in a more in a more interesting interesting way I, I talk sometimes to to younger younger people even in the company and you're like okay so what are the, the things that you've been observing so how do you get inspired what types of, uh, of bands can you can you tell me about what is your favorite I don't know design object or something and I, I feel that people are too focused on the day to day and on the things that lead them to become in theory better marketers but not looking outside and i think that's a big uh, that's a big miss so you talk about everything else i mean that that's really big you know be interested in other stuff apart from marketing basically i mean which is good advice and i think that if you're going to be a good marketer you need to be a, an aware and conscious citizen of the world on a variety of different levels as you point out but where are the most valuable places to focus curiosity for someone who is coming into the business who isn't just looking at the uh, you know the specifics of marketing where where do you think is a rich source of inspiration i think i think definitely design is one Right, so I, 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 most of my career was was uh, spent on um, the the packaged goods uh, industry, so I think appreciating uh, uh, visuals makes sense for for a lot of reasons from the more lame and cheap. 
<laughs> sort of perspective, which is like PowerPoint design and all that, all the way to sort of putting together a, a, a product that people will hold in their hands and say, wow, this is, there's something here that uh, pulls me to it. It's beautiful. It uh, doesn't matter if you're on a shelf or in a website and there's, there's some attention that is pulled to it. Uh, I think design is a, is a very, very important uh, source of, source of knowledge. So designing objects that uh, inspire some level of desire or pull some level of desire from consumers and from people in general, I think it's super, super important. But that's something you need to train, right? You need to be open to it. You need to have the curiosity and you need to sort of dig deeper to understand what works, what doesn't work. And it's like a, like a, a muscle, right? So that's one example. But I think also when you look at uh, like pop culture in general, uh, music, so what... Uh, are people listening to? Can that influence somehow the, the campaigns that we create, the artists that we partner with in case that makes sense for, for the brand that you work or the service that you, you provide? So just trying to be closer to the lives of people in general and not just be sort of uh, uh, distant from it. I think it's, uh, it's probably a healthy uh, advice. So assuming we're talking to a slightly different audience now, someone who's actually in the industry, they've graduated from being a student, they've got their first job. And so what is the top marketing tip that you find yourself sharing most often? I think that, uh, I think that's one of the best marketing tips I, I ever received. Uh, unfortunately, not directly, but it's something I read around maybe 10 years ago, I think. Yeah, I think I was basically putting together a, presentation. Uh, so the fact that I worked as a strike planner, when I moved to the client side, uh, I always felt the, the urge to bring the two worlds closer. And I felt that sometimes uh, the clients, they didn't even know the existence of uh, strategic planning and the beauty of this function in terms of driving business and driving uh, just very good communication. So I proposed to a international school that we have in, in, in Brazil, in Sao Paulo, which is called Miami Ed School, to come up with a, a course on the strategic planning uh, through the eyes of the, the marketing client. And while I was doing that research, I came across this uh, deck from Martin Weigel, who was back then uh, in, the, in the team from White and Kennedy. And I love one of the sentences that uh, he put on this very widely spread uh, slide, which is, uh, or wi widely spread presentation, rather that is, our task is not nurturing enthusiasm, but overcoming indifference. And this should inspire, not depress us. So I think basically that puts uh, us marketers uh, that like first that keeps us honest, that shows us that uh, we are not our badge or our company, even if we are sometimes um, sort of guided to think that. I think that keeps things in perspective. Right. And I think that helps us put the energy and the passion in the work, but also know that it's basically just work. And also to treat consumers as normal people who, in the majority of the cases, they could not care less about what we do, right? So I think the two points, they, in the end, they connect. So looking from th for things outside of marketing and at the same time knowing that also it's just marketing, I think allows you to be pushed and to push your teams to deliver more interesting, more creative things. So that's, that's a, a, a marketing tip and advice that will, I'll keep with me forever. This episode of the Shiny New Object podcast is brought to you in partnership with Madfest. Whether it's live in London or streamed online to the global marketing community, you can always expect a distinctive and daring blend of fast-paced content, startup innovation pitches, and unconventional entertainment from Madfest events. You'll find me causing trouble on stage, recording live versions of this podcast, and sharing a beer with the nicest and most influential people in marketing. Check it out at www.madfestlondon.com. We're now going to move on to your shiny new object, which is the ability to translate purpose 
and sustainability into commerce. Now, all of that makes sense to me, but can you just give the audience an overview of of what you mean by that and why it's your shiny new object? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, basically with this rise of all the topic around ESG, right? Environmental, social and governance uh, topics. So today, I mean, you even have like funds that only invest money into sort of ESG vetted uh, companies. There is a massive awareness around all of these topics and uh, every company, every brand now has its own purpose. It has its own sustainability strategy and so on and so forth. But what sometimes I struggle with, with uh, personally uh, in my job at, uh, at Danone, and I, I think that uh, probably other, other people listening to your, to your uh, podcast will relate to is this ability to move things from your corporate website or from the, the sheets or the slides in a PowerPoint deck to things that consumers can really relate to, right? So how do you translate the topics that are super, super dry into things that people relate to and eventually will bring them closer to your, to your brand, obviously in an authentic, in a, in a, in a relevant way. So this is something that is driving a little bit of my, my energy uh, in this past months. And I think this is a massive challenge for everyone involved in the FMCG space in the next maybe 18 to 24 months is to find a way to tell stories that translate uh, these complex topics in a creative and engaging way for for the for the audience and i think some brands managed to do that um i think i, I brought one one example uh from actually from ab and beth which i think it's a it's an interesting way uh if i if, if i'm allowed to share it i think it's a it's interesting. Yeah, please do. So basically, uh, in the US, I, I, I might not give it all the, the details. Uh, I, I hope I do justice to, for the, to this case. But basically, uh, my club is investing more and more in on its uh, organic range. And I mean, moving uh, uh, your sort of farming process to standard to organic, it's it's costly. Sometimes it does not yield the best uh, the best produce, etc. So what they did was they signed the contracts for three years down the road to buy the produce from those farmers. So three years from them, right? So ensuring that the whole process would lead to uh, a, a, a transaction and they transformed that obviously into a very nice film and tetra. But I mean, the concept of uh, standard versus uh, organic farming and even regenerative agriculture can be very dry, can be very complex, but I think they found a way to make it a little bit more relatable and hopefully to translate into, into more sales. I don't have the data, but uh, I, I would, I would, I would assume it is, it has an effect, it had an effect on, on sales uh, as well. So what worries me in that is you said that you know, all brands have a purpose now, uh, all brands are struggling to translate uh, purpose and sustainability. So is there a concern that this is going to become wallpaper, that that yes, it's organic, it's sustainable, we have a purpose? If everyone's kind of copying each other, is that going to create its own marketing problem? I think so. I think uh, I mean, some brands or some services are just brands and it's it's all good, right? A chocolate brand can be a chocolate brand and uh, and provide people with uh, like an indulgent moment and it's 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 good it's all good right i think the discussion we saw recently with the m M&M m characters that they are now uh, sort of uh, representing different types of of uh, consumers it's a more diverse uh, casting of characters i think raised some some eyebrows because i mean in the end it's maybe just m ms and it's it's okay right so should we basically translate uh, the the notion of a purpose to every single business every single service i don't think so i don't think so so in my previous role uh, i was more connected to the to the the space of of purpose and helping guide the the more iconic brands in our portfolio and we always try to push them to be within their own space right so right to play was a, was a, was a, was a concept that we use quite quite often there i mean don't don't try to be sort of drink the Kool-Aid too much and believe that you are 
maybe more than you should be, right? It is okay to just provide a good service, to be a brand that is tasty, that is providing a moment of pleasure. It's fine, right? You don't need to save the world uh, if you are, I don't know, maybe a toothbrush or, or, or something. But that's, that's, my, that's my perspective on the, on the matter. So I agree with you. I don't think that uh, we need to be very careful about this. So there's, there is a limited window for the early movers to differentiate in terms of sustainability and purpose and so on. But yes, that these these things might ca- catch up. So then, what's next? What in 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 the in the world where brands can do good, in the world where brands can change the world through their scale and their influence and their media budgets fundamentally? What's next? What what do you see as the the next few years in the purpose and sustainability place, and how that? impacts on commerce what are you excited about what's the future yeah i think the in the future what we're going to see is more uh i think i think we're going to 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 separate a little bit all the brands that just jumped on the bandwagon for those that made it uh in the right way right uh, they play within their 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 space they were able to translate it in a, in a creative way and they drove business, right? So here in the company, we believe that there is this infinite loop in which we say that the more we impact with some of our brands, the more we grow, right? So in the end, I mean, we are a for-profit, a for-profit uh, company and we have for-profit brands. So we believe that when you hit that sweet spot between uh, finding your space, translating that creatively, impacting positively uh, more people, this will probably generate benefits from a, from a business standpoint. But it's, it's tricky. It's tricky. Even within a, a company like the non-25 billion euro company, uh, we only probably have a, a handful of, uh, of uh, examples there. And we're still pushing to, to have more of those. So I think the new wave is actually the current wave. Uh, and when it comes to purpose and 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 creativity and driving uh, business effects, so I interviewed a guy called Michael Lee, who is the creative director on Oatly. I see he's been on the podcast and been on an, another show that I do called Advertisers Watching Ads, and their whole new campaign is is very much based around the idea of saying to people that it's. It's okay to be plant based sometimes. Whereas I think historically there's just been this like, you know, I'm I'm vegetarian, I'm pescatarian, I'm vegan. And it's like there's been very distinct kind of delineations between those groups. But this the rise of the the flexitarian is, is something I think that makes so much sense for, from a consumer perspective. Cause you know, sometimes you want to be good, sometimes you want to be bad and you want to drink terrible alcohol and get wasted and all the rest of it. And sometimes you, you know, you just want a cucumber sandwich. So I'm curious to know, like, is the opportunity in this kind of flexitarian middle, or do you think there'll always be a role for the kind of extremist brands and extremist consumers to educate the mainstream? No, I think I, I couldn't agree more with you. I think, uh, I mean, we are looking now uh, more towards the 700 million imperfect flexitarians than the 7 million perfect vegans, right? Again, back to the point on driving positive impact and then driving business growth. We want uh, more and more people to join this movement, right? It's It, it just makes sense to have a more sustainable and also healthy uh, plant-based diet. But we know that sometimes we just want to eat maybe uh, a burger and or have our favorite ice cream, dairy ice cream, and it's, it's fine, right? So as long as in the long run, there is a positive trend around it and more and more people uh, are, are behind it. Uh, yeah, I fully agree with, uh, I mean, we are in the same page when it comes to the Oldly campaign and from your, from your perspective. So I think we need to still deliver products that are tasty, of course, and allow vegans and flexitarians to have a very nice experience. Taste is a, is a huge barrier still. Uh, but in the end, I think it's, it's, it's about making these brands more mainstream and sort of uh, leveraging the awareness around the topic, which is everywhere. And here in Germany, it's massive. In the UK, you know, it's, it's also super, super big. And then just inviting these people and providing sort of the, the, the bridges for these people to, to, to join the, the, 
the, the space of Coinbase, for sure. So one of the interviews on the podcast last year that really stayed with me was a guy called uh, Manuel Gover. I think I'm saying his name sort of right. He, he works on Tobro and Odeeds um, at Mondelez. And he used to be a, a climate activist, I think, as well as footballer, oddly. And he said that he realized that he could make more of an impact on the environment by working for a large corporate. Because if he can change the way that that brand uh, creates its products and its marketing and so on and so forth, then actually can have a massive impact on that, the footprint of that brand. And I think that's a very persuasive message. You know, maybe going back to students or young people in the industry on you know wanting to make an impact on the world is that you know work for brands that are focused on that. But let's not talk about your current employer. But how would a person who wanted to work at a climate positive or climate pre- protecting brands how would they work out which ones were talking bs and which ones had the right intentions yeah, i mean you need to i think you need to be deeper into the into the reports i think you need to to do your your research but i tend to agree with this uh, with the opinion of your of your other guests uh because i mean you need scale to change things right so i think the the, the startups and the scale ups Potentially, they were the first ones to to sort of try to drive change. But at this point in time, at least from the FMCG world, I think all of the the big companies already realized that uh, we need to do things differently. So we cannot just think about uh, profit, profit, profit. That we need to to go beyond that and think also not only for around shareholders but also stakeholders in general so that uh, the whole the whole philosophy of being of treating business in a more holistic way uh but now i mean all, all the fmcgs they they got them got the memo right so i think once you are interested in, in joining a big company you do your bit of your due diligence and you make sure that things are are, 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 are for real. I think we, the big companies are more than welcome to, to have people willing to, to do things uh, in an in a exciting, uh, creative, interesting way and drive change. So there's a, there's a lot of that. So I, I experienced that myself. I mean, we have dairy brands and we have plant-based brands. And I think the pull around plant-based brands is, is fantastic within the ranks of, of, of Danone. And I bet it's the same in, in all of the, the other big FMCG companies. So yeah, I tend to agree. Scale leads to a more impactful um, change in the, in, the, in the medium term, for sure. So who's marketing in the purpose and sustainability world do you look at and think oh that's amazing who are your heroes in that space that are really solving that messaging and commerce challenge yeah so i think there is a couple of examples that i think are 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 brilliant right so i have a i have a couple so one is from from some years ago i think there's this this brand uh from um uh, feminine hygiene products that started lobbying against uh, the VAT. Uh, was it in Germany or in Poland? One of the two countries. And they realized that uh, feminine hygiene products w- received a higher tax versus uh, books. Uh, so they decided to launch these products as part of books and uh, basically have, have a, a lower incidence of of taxes in their product and make it more available. So I think that was just a brilliant way to sort of hack the system and fight for the right cause and make the product more more available. That that was a sort of a huge uh, PR campaign, drove a lot of business effect, etc. So it's something that uh, stuck with me. And then I think when you think about more from a corporate perspective, I think the work that Airbnb is doing uh, in terms of just hosting the refugees from the Afghanistan some time ago, but also now from, from Ukraine, I think it's just a spot on, right? I mean, you, you could not translate belonging in a more relevant way than just uh, staying attuned to this massive, massive crisis that is happening and trying to, to do your, your role there. So, so yeah, these are two of the examples that I, I came across recently that I think are, are interesting, just very inspiring. Patrick, unfortunately, we're at the end of the podcast. Now, if someone wanted to get in touch with you about anything we've discussed today, how would you like them to do that? Where would you like them to do that? And what makes a really good outreach message to you? So I think LinkedIn is fine. Uh, So as long as people read at least the... the first line of my bio or the header of my profile that uh, that tends to help, right? So I am a marketing person working in Germany. So 
potentially the Asian supply chain summit is not so much of my interest, but I mean, yeah, happy to be approached on LinkedIn, but uh, yeah, if people can just read the, the header first, uh, that, uh, that usually helps. Patrick, thank you so much for your time. Yeah, no worries. Thanks for having me. Hi, just before you go, I'd really appreciate it if you could take the time to write a review of the Shiny New Object Podcast on Apple Podcasts or iTunes, whatever it's called these days, or whichever podcast provider you use. We're an indie podcast, so it would go a long way for us if you could just share the word and give us a bit of a support on those channels. That'd just be fantastic. If you haven't got time, that's also cool. And yeah, if you could tell your colleagues about the podcast and also, if possible, don't forget to subscribe. And I'd love to hear your feedback. Uh, if you'd like to speak on the podcast or be a guest or you think I'm asking the wrong questions, anything, I'd be super interested to hear what you think. So please email me at tom at automatedcreative.net. That's T-O-M at, uh, I'm not going to bother spelling it. Anyway, you'll work it out. Thanks so much.